Hello and welcome to Treasury Notes, a show dedicated to the latest news and information from the office of West Virginia State Treasurer John Perdue. I'm your host, Gina Joins. The State Treasurer's Office reunites people with unclaimed money every day, but it's rare that we are able to return tangible unclaimed property items. Coming up on today's show, we'll see how simple name recognition helps reunite a local public figure with family treasures he believed were lost forever. That's coming up in just a bit. But first, the third phase in the state's ERP project, known as WV Oasis, is officially up and running. Oasis stands for Our Advanced Solution with Integrated Systems, and it will replace numerous applications being used within state agencies to handle everything from purchasing to payroll. This new business management software was designed specifically for West Virginia. It's expected to merge the various state agency computer systems into one statewide program. Joining me today to talk more about the latest implementation of WV Oasis is Project Manager Rick Pickens and Misty Price, Deputy Treasurer of Cash Management at the State Treasurer's Office. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks for having me. Well, Rick, let's start with a little background about WV Oasis. This project is a joint effort, we know, from the governor, the auditor, and the state treasurer. How did it first come about? Well, as you might expect, you know, systems go through a life cycle just like we do. Uh, it was, we were getting into the middle ages of WV FEMS, and folks were looking and saying, what do we go next? So those folks, in conjunction with the legislature, there was a bill passed to do a study of the current systems and where should we go next. And so when they looked at some of the problems at the 101 different systems or more out there doing accounting, they thought there's got to be a better way. So that really was the kickoff to what we're seeing today. And you talk about FIMS. For those people who don't know what FIMS is, can you explain what that is? Certainly. Uh, it's the financial information management system. It's the current accounting system that state uses. And one of the things that's interesting about it is I learned a new word. It's called bifurcated. I never knew that word before. But the idea is there was a system that was part of the uh, administration side and then a side that resided in the state auditor's office. So one of the things that OASIS is doing is just bringing that bifurcated system into one. Misty, we talk about bringing all these systems under one roof, essentially. Why is there a need to replace these business systems with a new application and one integrated system? Well, as uh, Rick had said, uh, FIMS was really um, just not meeting um, many of the needs that the state agencies had. So um, they, it was decided that uh, we would have uh, the new accounting system. and. Um, I think a lot of the agencies uh, had redundant systems. Um, they were spending a lot of money on having systems that were the same, and the, the new system offers um, agencies the ability to uh, use same, same modules that are kind of standardized that they could use. For example, we have a, an AR module, which is accounts receivable. Um, it wasn't offered in FIMS, and a lot of the different agencies use accounts receivable. So hopefully, um, as their uh, contracts roll off, we'll be able to incorporate some of their transactions into uh, the new accounting system. And you really expect this to improve the business flow around the state as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords that get thrown around. It's going to be transparent. It's going to be, um, you know, uh, more efficient um, standardization, but we're really hoping that um, it, it does standardize the process for state employees. And then, you know, as state employees become more familiar with uh, the system, then they can uh, get the information out of the system a little more e easily and then uh, be able to help taxpayers and their managers in their office maybe make better business decisions too. And this is such a big undertaking. It's, it's a really complex project, and because of that, Rick, it's being rolled out in stages. Can you kind of explain to us and walk us through the process of this implementation? I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> the, the first phase went live uh, about this time last year, actually the 1st of August, and it was the budget module, and we used that module to develop the budget for fiscal 15 that we're just entering. So that made sense. Uh, the second phase was uh, some engineering software for the Department of Transportation that's necessary for them to be able to decommission their integrated system with uh, accounting and the engineering aspect of what they do. The phase we've just rolled out, financials, is huge, as you said, 
and was the next logical progression. Uh, advice from our consultants and what we've seen in, in other states is you put financials up before you put payroll. So sometime uh, in January we should come up with HR payroll. So now we'll have an integrated um, uh, payroll HR system and a centralized HR system, which we don't have today. And then, of course, our last phase is, again, some additional engineering uh, functionality for the Department of Transportation, but there's also some pieces in there that other agencies will use, like uh, facilities, um, a larger inventory portion, things of that nature. All right. And as you said, Phase C of the WV Oasis system was officially launched in early July. As part of the board overseeing the project, Treasurer Purdue and Auditor Gaynor were on hand that day to make sure everything went according to plan. Phase C, the third phase in the implementation of WV Oasis, targets the financial, procurement, and treasury applications of this new statewide integrated software. Treasurer Purdue and Auditor Gaynor were on hand to make sure everything ran accordingly. One of the first tests of this phase was processing and printing the first batch of checks received from the new system. During this inaugural run, a total of 4,422 checks were run, totaling more than $1.7 million. From the first check to the last, everything came off the printer without a hitch. <laughs> Pretty exciting, and you said definitely uh, two proud people right there to see that system go off for sure. Um, I'm here with Rick Pickens and Misty Price talking about WV Oasis. Misty, as we just saw, the third phase of this project it went live, and it deals with many of the functions that are particular to the treasurer's office. Can you tell us what's involved with the aspect of what you're working with? Yes, Spacey was the one that we were waiting on. Um, <laughs> Patiently waiting. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, and design and uh, testing so when it went live we were very excited um, most uh, all of the financial information that we use in process uh, is done through FACI so that is um, information like uh, cash receipts so all of the cash receipts that are entered how we take revenue into the state is done uh, through our module um, also any payments electronic paper um, those are processed now through Oasis investments. Uh, all of these processes are ones that you know we've taken a hand in designing and making sure they flow through, and the agencies um, can actually enter the information in. Um, Tops uh, was an old uh, program that we had that we uh, kind of retired, so we could roll it into the new system, and that's how we um, people look up checks and agencies look up checks and do stop payments and a variety of other banking functions. That's now rolled into Oasis and um, performed. So that's kind of the agency side of it. And then now that all of financial data and information flow through OASIS, we do our central processing through there too, which is a lot of the setting the daily cash position, using the reporting to do that, and even um, doing our reverse positive pay. So a lot of processing, both on the agency side and as a central role is is there. So really now the big question is how's it going? I, I know um, implementation day went pretty well and uh, I think everybody was uh, very pleased with how that went. Rick, how is the transition going? Because really we are kind of still in a transition as employees start to really use this new program. And I think transition is a, a great way to describe it. I think folks had 21 years of using films, so that's a long time to get into a rut and this is how I work. So now they have a new toy and they need to learn how to use that. So there's a little bit of angst of giving up the old and moving into the new, but evidently we're doing well. I just heard a statistic yesterday that in the first week we had over 20,000 transactions added you know, man through the online and another 150,000 through interfaces. So I think things are, are moving in the right direction. Misty, now that Phase C is live, how has it impacted the operations at the Treasurer's Office? As we just said, this is really um, uh, the biggest part for our office. Right. Uh, most of the processing going on um, is all through OASIS now. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges we're going through is um, we're uh, getting calls from agencies um, needing some help with how to process the transition period and doing the transactions and uh, us learning how to do the central agency role. And then, of course, with any system that comes up, there are a few problems or issues that pop up, and we're trying to work through those with 
um, different agencies and sometimes just internally. And what kind of feedback are the two of you getting from how the system's working so far? I think fairly positive. I, I yeah. have to echo that. Yeah. I think I've heard good stuff. Yeah, I know there were a lot of concerns um, early on. I think it's changing to excitement. You think so? I it, do. That's that's great news because I know um, there were newspaper articles written that you know, uh oh, this is this is getting ready to go live. It's such a big system. It's such a big undertaking. And I know other states have done similar things, but the way we're doing it is is going. It's got to be unique because it's unique to the needs of West Virginia. So. I think it, there is some excitement going on now. Absolutely. Um, you know, Rick, I, I really wanted to talk to you about this. We explained a little bit earlier about FIMS and what FIMS was. <laughs> I guess it's 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 gone gone away now. Um, it was implemented 20 years ago, and, and a lot of people who work for the state they were they were actually here when it was when it was first being launched, and it was the new toy, the new system to use. How Sorry. does this transition compare? It's it's apples and oranges. Uh, um, I was one of those people there when FEM started. We were actually having to teach users keyboarding skills because they were used to processing paper and not to using a machine, you know, to enter their data. So now, you know, with with us uh, a workforce that's uh, internet savvy because of everything we do, you know, it's it's somewhat simpler for them to do the navigation, but it's um, uh, it's still new, you know, and you people have to get beyond that shininess, you know, and go ahead and move forward and use their training. And people are creatures of habit, so there, they are. there is going to be a learning curve with this new system. To try and combat that, there's been a lot of training going on. Talk about some of the training, Misty. Um, there have been, it, it was actually done um, very well. They have uh, several different um, training classes and it was broken down into specific different areas that each person and each employee uh, was tailored to. So if uh, you had uh, your agency, you did procurement and cash receipts, then you had two different classes to go through. So you weren't sitting through classes where the information didn't pertain to you. There was a nice um, getting started class that everybody went to to get just a general overview of how the classes were, uh, how the system was going to work. And then after that, it was broken down into the different areas and you got to select which area that uh, the employee needed to go to. And people were taking these classes and there, some of the classes are still being offered as right. refresher courses, right? Right, they started back in May and um, I think they go uh, through almost the end of July um, if, if anybody wants to do that. And then they've also held some workshops. So in case you've already attended the class and then you have maybe an additional question that popped up you can go um, and ask questions there. And I keep saying this is a big undertaking for the state, but but it really is. And there have been resources from all the constitutional officers dedicated solely to this project and personnel dedicated solely to this project to make sure that it, it, it was planned efficiently, it gets up and running, and then it continues to run. Absolutely, and, I, and you used the word dedicated a couple of times there, and I don't think we could say it enough because people are putting in extra time because they have to do, in a lot of cases, the work from their normal job back at their agency as well as the work we're asking them to do with OASIS. So we're, we're very lucky that we have the staff we mm -hmm. have. Definitely. And, and you know, as we said, a lot of training going on, but if people have questions now that we're in the system for the most part, um, FACI really was the biggest chunk of the system. Now that we're into it, if people have concerns, how are, how are they handling the concerns? Well, um, the ERP board did a very nice job of setting up a help desk for folks to call if they had any questions. They had, can call, they can actually email too. Um, and those were manned uh, for 12 hours a day when we first went live. Uh, still are. Still are. Um, and that will continue. And then, of course, if you have any questions, um, some of the smaller questions as people come into your agency, folks have been helping. It, it seems like that really all the employees from all the agencies really just want to get it right. And Rick, this uh, phase of the project has had a great impact on vendor services as well. What changes uh, can outside vendors expect because we've been talking up to this point about state employees? I think the vendor community has a lot to look forward to. Uh, about all they've been exposed to so far is their ability to go in and maintain their own information that the state uses to issue procurements and to pay uh, and to, to make payments. 
but eventually they'll be able to receive solicitations through this vendor uh, portal and at some point being able to process an invoice through the portal into us. So we may get to a point where we're absolutely paperless. And the, there will also be some self-service features for vendors and absolutely, employees, as absolutely. you were talking about. And, and I should have used that term, because that's exactly what it is. And, and they're already using, in fact, the, the vendor self-service went up in mid-June. So some of those folks have taken advantage of that. They've gone in, they've started cleaning up the data that we took from these disparate systems and plugged together and now have the data organized or beginning to have the data organized the way they want to see it. State employees will also have that option to go in, update their contact information, update certain certain items that they select um, typically through their HR people as well. Right, and that's something we have to look forward to in the, in the phase D, in the HR payroll phase. All right, well we're talking about the current status of WV Oasis, the largest government improvement project ever unveiled in West Virginia. When we return, we'll take a look ahead at what comes next for this project. Stay with us. Welcome back to Treasury Notes. The WV Oasis project has been in the works for several years now, but this complex system is being rolled out one phase at a time. WV Oasis is an integrated computer suite designed to replace various accounting, purchasing, and payroll systems around the state. I'm here today with Rick Pickens, project manager for WV Oasis, and Misty Price, deputy treasurer here at the treasurer's office. Again, thank you both for talking more to us about this system. Um, Rick, we talked earlier about the most recent phase of the program was unveiled in July, and now let's talk a little bit about the future of Oasis. What happens next? Because we're not done unveiling the system yet. That's quite correct. I mean, there's a lot more yet to be done. As large as C was and as large as the training effort was, when we do HR payroll, there's also a time collection element. So a lot of folks are going to have to learn a new timekeeping method almost every single state employee. Some of it will be simpler for, some it may be harder. But we're trying to bring technology in, like if you walk through hospitals and see nurses swipe a card and, and that puts them on the clock, there'll be similar things for state employees. So I think there's a, a lot to look forward to, a lot of efficiency still yet to come. All right, and Misty, our office really plays a big role in unveiling OASIS, as we said earlier. Uh, phase C, the phase that we just implemented, was the biggest phase for the state treasurer's office. Um, as we look to the future, how will we be involved in the future of OASIS? Uh, well, I think what we're trying to at least do now and what we're looking forward to is um, as agencies call and we see different concerns about how the system is uh, working now, how can we improve that as we go along? You know, uh, we, we're kind of taking notes with that. And then as the users and the employees get more familiar with the system, they're going to find uh, and maybe have suggestions of their own on what we can do to make things easier on them. So that's kind of the, some of the things that we're looking forward to. Plus, we do have a small piece in some of the payroll uh, inf information, but not nearly what we had with FACE-C. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the benefits of the program and, and this, this suite of systems that we have. Um, you know, it took a lot of money, a lot of work to get this implemented. Both it wasn't things. easy. Um, uh, you know, we're, I've heard that it's replacing more than 100 systems around right. the state. Um, but in the end, they're saying that it's going to save money, it's going to save time, it's going to make the state more efficient. What do you have to add to that, Rick? Uh, I think there's a lot of, the, I think they call them soft savings, there's some things that we're going to have information on that we didn't have in the past. Uh, what we're pushing for is a lot of commodity based uh, purchases, so now we'll get costing information at item levels because in my, my 20 some years in FEMS I had a lot of financial managers asking me, well how much did we spend on this gadget? 
and you did, couldn't really pull all that information together because everybody recorded it a little differently or at such a high level that we couldn't give them the, the data they needed. Now I think OASIS is going to replace that. There's also some of these modules that aren't the ones that we're really talking about today. You know, I mentioned facilities earlier. Well, there's like a preventive maintenance piece in there. Well, how much money have we spent in recent years, you know, trying to catch up on the, the buildings that the states own on their maintenance? So if we can stay up with that, then maybe we can reduce maintenance costs going for, further. And when you hear a lot of the, the cost savings put out there, that's really some of the hard cost of replacing those 101 systems. Now we don't have to pay for those anymore, that right. redundancy. So I think there's there's a lot of, to be excited about, a lot to look forward to. Transparency, we've heard a lot about that. Transparency is also a big one. Uh, there's there's uh, an existing tra uh, transparency site that we use from FEMS data and other sources within the state. But now again, we're having a lot more information and a lot to share with, with the taxpayers just to see, you know, uh, what state government is doing with their tax dollars. What about resistance? Has there been any resistance from some of the employees just as they try to transition and learn this new program? I think no more than you can expect from human nature because we, as we've spoken before, you know, this is something new and there's a little bit of angst about, you know, clicking that uh, button the first time. But uh, just like with FEMS, I think within a month or so, it'll be second nature to them. And I think that uh, even those that may be grumbling a little bit right now, I think that uh, they'll be much happier in another month or two. And I think we've already seen that to some extent oh, that, have. you know, the first few days it was, you know, the transactions were a little slower than, and each day they just kind of picked up as we were going along. So People were getting more used to mm -hmm. the system. Right. If you could pick one thing to, to say of what you feel about Oasis and, and what your excitement has been as we unveil this project, what would that be? Um, I think all of the reporting and the information that we hope to get out of it in the end, um, you know, there's a, a lot of information being collected and a lot of different ways to sort it. And to be able to get that information out and uh, whether it be a manager who needs it or a taxpayer or the legislature or whoever needs to use it, that information should be there and we should be able to run some type of report to get it to them so they can make some kind of informed decision. Have you heard from the constitutional officers, the governor, the treasurer, the auditor? What are they saying? Are they excited to see this finally, finally come to fruition? I think so. And just like we saw in the video, you know, it, July 8th came and it, checks were printed and we, it, the process and the it system worked. was working. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> um, do you have any message for state employees, the people and, who've been working with this program, working to unveil this and really working to get it kickstarted, plus all the people now who, who've been training and, and just trying to use it every day? The obvious word is thank you. I mean, uh, there's been patience, you know, and as we address the little glitches that come up, uh, all the contributions that mm -hmm. our, our team's made, all the contributions that uh, folks have made in the agencies, picking up work for those guys who are off working mm -hmm. with us, you know, we just can't thank people enough. I think uh, there's a lot of benefit down the road. There's a lot of people to share in, uh, in the uh, pride that we're going to have in this system. And if you could describe just one thing that you're really looking forward to with having this new system. Uh, well, you know, we talked earlier, you know, I've been with FEM since it was designed and there was a lot of potential there that went unfulfilled. And I think this system is going to fill that out. So as I head off into my retirement <laughs> years, I'll be happy with what was left behind you know, for my work effort. Absolutely. All right. Thank you both so much for joining us here Thanks today. Rick you. Pickens, Misty Price, we truly appreciate you both being here. And I look forward to talking with you again soon for more updates on WVOASIS. I'm sure this won't be the last time we have a discussion. <laughs> While many Treasury staff members focus on WVOASIS, work continues in other divisions under Treasurer Purdue's direction. It's been a great year for the people in our unclaimed property program. As we talked about on our last program, Carolyn Atkinson, the Deputy Treasurer of Unclaimed Property, was recently given a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Unclaimed Property Administrators. The program also reached a milestone when it surpassed $5 million in e-claims. Those are claims generated electronically. Unclaimed property can be claimed in a variety of ways, but it is not always the property owner that initiates the claim. Kim Ward explains. Treasure Purdue has staff members around the state searching for unclaimed property owners every day in an effort to give them a check. 
Recently, though, one of those field staff members was able to return a different kind of unclean property, all because he recognized a name on his list. And Mayor, I, I'm honored to be able to give you these items back because I know they mean so much to you. The unclaimed property items Treasurer Purdue returned to Nitro Mayor David Casebolt were the contents of a forgotten safe deposit box. Well, after a certain period of time, a bank's uh, safe deposit box come dormant and they have to return those items over to the state treasurer's office. And then it's their responsibility to try to find the rightful owners for all those items that they were unable to find. These items here that have been returned to me were actually rings that uh, were handed down to my first wife by her grandmother. I, I remember when, when she gave these to her and, and uh, how emotional she was about it. And, and you could tell immediately what they meant to her. So uh, it, it, uh, I'm very excited to get these back to her. Turning items like this to individuals really touches your heart because it means so much to them. While some people store pricey valuables in a safe deposit box, most of the time the contents turned over to the treasurer's office have more of a personal value. I have no idea what the value of these rings are, but they are priceless to her. She, we had always wondered what happened to these rings. It don't mean too much for anyone else, but means a lot to that individual that had that safe deposit box. Long dormancy periods and outdated contact information make it difficult to locate the owners of a safe deposit box, so very rarely is the treasurer's office able to find and return this tangible property to the rightful owners. We returned over $120 million to the people in this yeah. state, but returning personal items like this is very difficult. And we thought they were lost forever. Never did, never had any idea where they were. Luck and simple name recognition helped reunite Mayor Casebolt with his lost family treasure. It started when a field representative from the treasurer's office recognized the local mayor's name in a list of unclaimed property owners. When Roger Hughes from the state treasurer's office called and told me that he had located some rings, we, I knew immediately what they were. So. Case Bolt's status as a public figure made it much easier to identify and locate this particular property owner, but it doesn't always work out that way. If the treasurer's office attempts to locate the owner of safe deposit box contents proves unsuccessful, the items are eventually put up for auction due to lack of storage space. The proceeds from the auction are then held and can be claimed by the owner. If you think there's a chance some of your old family treasures may have ended up in our unclaimed property vault, it's easy to check and see. Just go to wvtreasury.com to do an unclaimed property search. And if you're interested to see what treasures may be available in our unclaimed property auction right now, you can do that from our website as well. Reporting for Treasury Notes, I'm Kim Ward. All right, thanks so much, Kim. And that's all the time we have. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can always get the latest news and information from the state treasurer's office. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or check out our blog for financial information. Connect with the Treasurer's Office today. Visit us at wvtreasury.com. Keeping you informed on the Library Television Network, I'm Gina Joins with the Office of West Virginia State Treasurer, John Perdue.